So um, I, I've attended uh, half of uh, so far the sessions, and much of the talk is talking about uh, um, putting humans in the center of healthcare in the age of technology. And I really want to thank uh, Abraham and the organizers for their leadership to calling out this critical theme. And uh, today I want to share with you um, a preliminary set of work that uh, my colleagues and I have been doing here at Stanford, looking at the combination of AI technology and healthcare in a slightly different way, uh, less about uh, diagnosis, but more about the workflow and the whole um, ambient environment of healthcare delivery. And before I um, talk about the details, I really want to thank the teams for this uh, um, already five years of tireless work, the students, uh, the AI students, the medical students, the doctors. I especially want to call out Professor and Dr. Arnie Milstein, who has been a partner uh, in crime with me for, for five years. When we started this discussion of AI and healthcare delivery, AI wasn't the, the, the hype of the day yet. Uh, and uh, um, it's really uh, very much due to his vision and leadership that uh, our team has been working so well together. And again, also partners, in, uh, our uh, healthcare institution partners, uh, to start with Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and Stanford uh, uh, Adult Hospital here on campus, also Intermountain Healthcare System, Unlock uh, Senior Home Healthcare in San Francisco, as well as uh, Shanghai's uh, Raging Hospital. So clearly, healthcare is a top concern of Americans as well as just the global um, the, the, the global population. And I don't need to uh, share with you the issues we have about healthcare here. Ninety-nine percent of you here know way more than I do about this. Um, but also, excitingly, um, in the you know modern history of healthcare and medicine, there has been a lot of improvements in our way of understanding pathology, physiology, in drug discovery, vaccination, medical imaging, uh, medical devices, um, precision medicine, computational genomics. So lots and lots of efforts are being done and exciting, um, exciting work have been uh, created. And uh, this is even more exciting in the age of big data and uh, artificial intelligence for many of my colleagues in healthcare uh, as well as in technology, we see AI and machine learning becoming new tools that could facilitate the advance of medicine. While there is so much talk about AI and machine learning for radiology, for drug discovery, for uh, EHRs, EMRs, prediction, and all this, I actually want to bring your attention to a very different space in healthcare. And in fact, the very word care happens here. It's the physical space of healthcare. It's our ED, our ICUs, operation rooms, hospital wards, senior homes, uh, senior homes, as well as just our own homes. And a lot of healthcare events happen in this space. And we would like to find ways to uh, improve this. And um, so the central thesis of the work in my um, um, in Arnie and my uh, team is about endowing healthcare spaces with ambient intelligence. So what is ambient intelligence? Um, ambient intelligence can be defined many ways, but here's one good definition we, uh, we agree with um, by, um, uh, by someone called Ro Peeper. Um, the future will be one where our environment satisfies our needs, mostly without our having to think about it. The intelligence is ambient, much like the light in the room, the electric electricity that is uh, providing to us. We don't have to think about it, yet it's there to serve our purpose. Why do we think this is important? It goes back to a topic that a lot of us have been talking about today, 
is that there is a lot of need to improve healthcare quality as well as to reduce health healthcare uh, medical errors. Of course, medical errors come in many different forms. There's diagnostic <laughs> errors, there's delivery errors, there is uh, um, there is just many different kinds. And we all know that to err is human. We probably cannot hope to possibly eliminate all medical errors on our own. At least it's, um, that has been a journey, a long journey, we, and we haven't achieved that. And uh, so, so the thesis of our work is that can we use AI and can we use, can we make our healthcare space smart enough that we can help to increase quality of healthcare delivery? And um, why are there errors? A lot of the errors are centered around people. And uh, healthcare is complex. Even the delivery activities themselves are very, very complex. There are many potential sources of error from you know, hand hygiene practice to, uh, malfun uh, to um, the lack of uh, uh, adherence to protocols and to uh, you know, unintentional forgetfulness and all that. And there has been quite a bit of work um, that tries to close some of these gaps. So using localized solutions, for example, um, um, you know, uh, mobility-induced detector to reduce uh, 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 bed ulcers, or um, hand hygiene RFID devices, or um, um, ways to count surgical um, sponges. These are all localized solutions to try to uh, reduce healthcare error. And there has been improvement. But there seemed to be the sense that every time we discover or someone writes a paper about one type of error, we have to come up with a localized solution to address that error at all, uh, uh, specifically. And there are so many possibilities in the healthcare delivery um, process that this will get, um, this, this number of uh, solutions would just explode and, and uh, it'll be very difficult for, for clinicians to track this and they're not necessarily effective. So about five years ago, Arnie and I started talking about this whole thing. And we wanted to take a step back and think about a different way of thinking about ambient intelligence in healthcare and AI's role. And we started talking about self-driving cars. Uh, the idea of self-driving cars is not that new. It's not a 21st century concept. Uh, you know, robots and, and self-driving cars have been in the talks for for, for many decades, yet it's the recent evolution and combination of smart sensors, deep learning algorithm, big data, and all this that really um, push forward this technology and starting to realize the home of self-driving cars. And we want to take a page out of this combination of from smart sensors to smart uh, algorithms and think about what we can do for healthcare system. So imagine a future hospital where there is a lot of sensors that is helping us to uh, monitor and, uh, and, and gather information of this physical uh, space. And uh, there is a lot of busy work by clinicians, there is uh, patients, but we hope that um, the combination of sensor and backend algorithm technology can help our, pay, uh, our clinicians to improve their procedures, to avoid medical errors, and to watch their um, um, practices if, if necessary. So um, what is needed to achieve this? In a recently published uh, op-ed in New England Journal of Medicine, we talk about three uh, critical steps or ingredients. The first one is to transform the physical space with sensing ability. Think about, again, our self-driving cars. If you live in the Bay Area, you must have seen a lot of self-driving cars from all kinds of companies running around on the street with their sensors and, 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 all, uh, and so on. So we want to put different modern sensors into the physical space. Then these sensors help to collect data 
and really in the back end is modern computer vision and machine learning algorithms that help to recognize different healthcare activities that matter to clinicians as well as patients. And we'll get into the details of each of this. And uh, of course, the key here is human activity understanding. Healthcare is about human, is human-centered. Whether it's patients or nurses or doctors, we need to recognize important critical human activities. And this has been actually a core problem in uh, classic AI, specifically an area that's dear to my heart, is called computer vision, is we have been studying for decades this problem of human activity uh, recognition. And then the third ingredient of an, a smart hospital um, is the integration of the clinical data ecosystem, not just uh, data coming from the sensors, but data from HR, from uh, um, radiology, and so on, that together will make the healthcare delivery system better. So with these three ingredients in mind, I'm going to show some of, highlight some of the work examples that we have been doing as a group. And I'm trying to um, also group them into these three ingredients. So I'll start with uh, sensors, and then I'll get into some of the, I'll geek in uh, on some of the uh, human activity recognition work, and then highlight um, a couple of the ecosystem work. Hopefully that'll give you an overview of what we're doing. So in terms of sensing, well, um, it's, healthcare is a very, very special space. It's, you know, it's not like airport or subway. You kind of accept whatever cameras and sensors um, they put there. For healthcare, we need to think about several important issues. First, it's important to recognize and respect privacy of our clinicians as well as our patients. We also want to sense over the space. The space is very complex and prevalent. And we want to sense over time. A lot of the fatigue of our clinicians is that they're just overworked. And um, so our sensors need to help cover space time 24-7. And uh, the good news is that modern sensors are starting to answer to these needs. So this is a typical image from a depth sensor. So first of all, it doesn't show anybody's face. It is, has anyone played Xbox here or have kids playing Xbox? So this is very similar to the Xbox Connect sensor. And, uh, and a show, uh, it, uh, um, it gets a lot of uh, uh, information of the space without revealing people's, uh, people's uh, uh, faces. And we have already been working with Lucille Packer as well as Intermountain in Utah to install these sensors in uh, hospital units as, as well as ICU units in, in terms of um, collecting um, clinical activity data here. Um, here's the kind of uh, videos we stream from these modern sensors. They're actually noisy, so there's a lot of smart machine learning algorithm algorithm that has to happen behind the scene to get uh, meaningful data out of it. But these are the kind of uh, data you get to, raw data that you get to see here. This is a, um, used to be the third floor of the Lucille Packer Hospital. Um, another sensor that uh, complements depth sensor is thermal sensor. Thermal sensor is great to focus on people, especially um, when people are under a bed sheet and, and so on and uh, it provides uh, 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 useful physiological information such as sleep, uh, breathing, and so on. And uh, with this, we're working with Unlock, the San Francisco's uh, uh, senior home, where we put both thermal sensors as well as depth sensors in a few of the senior, um, um, senior uh, living areas and to help uh, 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 monitor the, the activities of, of seniors. Um, this is my students, my PhD students uh, and master's students installing thermal sen sensors in San Francisco. Um, um, 
Of course, there is a lot of data once the sensors are there. If we want a relatively reasonable resolution, we're talking about per sensor, nine gigabytes of data per hour. Um, and if we have an area of 50 sensors, we're talking about half a terabyte per hour, and we want this 24-7. Uh, and if we downsample in a clever way, we can reduce this. And there is a lot of behind the scene work going on both at the sensor side as well as the algorithm side to address these big data computational issues. Um, OK, so that was a quick summary of the kind of sensors we use and the environment we put in sensors. So now let me get to the, the more meaty part of the algorithm part is how do we recognize human activities in healthcare settings? And there's just so many things we can do. We will be, uh, we, we have projects looking at hand hygiene pro practice, we have projects looking at ICU activities, we have projects looking at senior activities, independent living activities. I would just quickly uh, show one or two without diving too deep into all of them. Um, so again, let me remind you that we have a dynamic physical space and the, the, it come with challenges. It's dynamic because we have, in healthcare condition, we have a lot of rich temporal activities. You know, think about ICU, on average, a nurse practice um, performs about 180 different activities per shift in the ICU environment. We also have um, all kind of unexpected ways of behavior when you have humans, um, you know, we're not talking about manufacturing floor. People have different kind of new environment and new activities. These are highly dynamic, challenging environment that even computer vision algorithm uh, research itself haven't seen much of that. Um, it's also a physical space, which is, uh, which is very highly constrained. Much of computer vision's human activity algorithm today in academia is developed using YouTube data. Most of them are TV data. But this is very different when you think about sensors in physical space. So this is a new challenge we have to deal with, and uh, which means there's viewpoint challenges as well as computational efficiency challenges. So um, let me just uh, show you one particular um, uh, work we did together is on trying to uh, use hand hygiene practice data to um, address the problem of uh, viewpoint diversity, which is what physical sensors, um, um, it's a challenge coming from physical sensors. And okay, I'm geeking out a little bit. Um, so some of you might heard of convolutional neural network. This is one of the um, uh, revolution of AI and machine learning in the recent years. And a typical ConvNet recognize images, still images very well, and label it with a classic cat or, or Persian cat and so on. But um, in the hospital, we are in a dynamic environment. So we want to go beyond images. Um, so the first challenge we're handling is a viewpoint challenge. And the second challenge we have to handle is tracking. Our sensors have a, um, have a range about five meters, three to five meters, but people go around in, in, in large space, so we have to track a person from one place to another. These are, uh, uh, these are technical problems we need to solve. Um, I'm not gonna uh, dive into this. We have, we, to address the problem of a viewpoint challenge, we have uh, developed a, a, a um, convolutional neural network based algorithm that transforms images in different ways so that we can do better hand hygiene recognition. And uh, to also address the problem of tracking people from camera to camera, we have, we have to develop another set of algorithms um, to, to combine the camera, different multi-camera views. This is really for those AI technologists in the audience to, to show you that we have papers doing this. Um, but the, the, the clinical setting we're trying to answer here is, can we monitor hand hygiene practice in an unbiased, continuous way? And this is a major cause of hospital-acquired infection, which also causes lots of death in hospitals. And 
till for decades the way to monitor hand hygiene is by sending secret shoppers to audit, which is not 24 seven, it's time consuming and it's very biased. And uh, so what we have shown here is some result um, in um, Lucio Packer Hospital in a, a range of uh, 90 minutes-ish. At the bottom row is the ground truth of hand hygiene events occurrence. This is where the trained doctors and students are labeling the ground truth um, of hand hygiene occurrence. Um, on the top three row, one observer, three observer, four observer, these are all auditors, human auditors detected hand hygiene um, events. And you can see the top three row compared to the ground truth, the bottom row, it's very sparse. Human auditors have attention issues, fatigue. They don't get to, there's a lot of bias and, and mistakes. But the, the row above the ground truth, the, the second to the last row, is what our algorithm did. And it has a 99.3 sensitivity and 97.8 specificity. So it's highly, highly accurate compared to human observers. And it doesn't fatigue, it's continuous, uh, both in space and time. And uh, we're also able to uh, map out the whole track of the clinician's behaviors. Uh, this is a slow video, I'll just advance. And uh, um, so, so basically by combining the hand hygiene uh, event detection with the tracking, our algorithm is able to compute hand hygiene compliance rate automatically in clinical settings. And this, uh, this was hardly ever done before, and it offers a new way of thinking about monitoring these uh, behaviors and, and eventually sending real-time feedback. Um, which, speaking of which, we, we are in the middle of thinking about how we can send real-time feedback to our clinicians. Um, okay, so um, next, hand hygiene was one activity that mattered to our clinicians, so we piloted that the first. But our clinicians also in ICUs tells us that another very valuable uh, work we can do for them is to actually help them to observe multiple behaviors, like patient behaviors, clinician behaviors. This is important for workflow optimization, activity-based costing, as well as optimization of uh, um, just uh, uh, protocols. So, um, so this is, uh, brings us to a second work we call dense multi-labeling of human activities. And the goal is that we would like to, you know, um, have a set of behaviors that matter in clinical session, uh, settings, like take blood pressure, uh, pressure, place pressure cuff, use stethoscope and all this, and then monitor all of them throughout time in a very complex environment. And uh, this creates a challenge to traditional convolutional neural network, which does well in static images. So we have to actually look beyond traditional CNNs. And, uh, and also in computer vision research, people tend to just assign one activity per video. That's the sort of the kind of research that's going on in a typical computer vision setting. And we have to go beyond that. Oh, even some of the multi-activity work is kind of sparse, whereas we need to go a lot more beyond uh, what traditional computer vision activity is doing and uh, getting to the dense labeling like this. So, um, so this is what we call fine-grained activity recognition in clinical settings. Um, yeah, I expect you to understand this slide completely. Um, so we use a combination of con convolutional neural network and recurrent neural network with some attention models to model the, the, the videos. Uh, again, for those of you who want to geek out, check out this paper or talk to us afterwards. But uh, this is to just show you that there's some smart AI going on behind the scene. <laughs> so, um, of course, we tested this on standard data sets, and our work does very well at the time of publication. And uh, our blue bar shows our performance is better 
compared to the state of the art uh, red bars. And uh, we've put this in the Intermountain uh, ICU units, and we start to uh, monitor um, patient um, activities. For now, we're looking at a smaller set of activities like getting out of bed, getting into the bed, and all this. And we will slowly extend it to uh, clinical care, like turning patients, oral care, and, and all this. So, um, so that was uh, about using advanced computer vision activity recognition in an ICU setting. Um, last work I want to just briefly talk about is um, a senior home uh, study that, that is ongoing. Clearly, senior population, aging society is a huge, huge problem. It creates a lot of healthcare costs, and it's really uh, highly critical for the, for the quality of life for our population. And um, when we talk to geriatricians, we learn that if we have a better understanding of some of the critical activities and behaviors of our aging seniors, it would help clinicians, families, and, and patients themselves to age better, to, to maximize independent living, and, and do early detection of potential clinical uh, uh, issues. And for example, just one simple example is falling. Falling is costly at a national scale and fatal to individuals, uh, seniors. And uh, um, we've talked to clinicians from ICUs to senior homes how much they would love to have a real-time alert sensor of falling. And uh, so we start to collect data in unlock um, um, in, in the unlock senior home setting in San Francisco. But I want to show you the, the challenges in healthcare data. We don't have like massive amount of YouTube data or, or so for example, um, um, falling is a rare event and we cannot possibly get hundreds and thousands of falling data uh, from um, sensors. Maybe we can if we aggregate worldwide sensors, but that would be difficult. So we also have you know, in general, limited data. So without getting into the details, we start to tap into some of the most exciting advanced machine learning algorithms to start self-extrapolate ways of detection, detecting uh, activities. For example, there's one line of work called self-supervised learning. Um, again, I'm just going to skip this due to time as well as um, there is a lot more uh, technical work going on in in terms of leveraging on, um, on other data to learn about uh, human activities. Um, there's also this idea of transfer learning where we train uh, the algorithm with data that are more readily available and transfer some of the rare event into the, into the algorithm so that it can help, it can do a better job detecting rare events. And uh, I'm gonna skip this. This is a, uh, just a result video. I think that was a mock um, <laughs> event. <laughs> so um, we also are starting to um, try to identify different behavior patterns and try to build, uh, starting to work on a project to build a personalized profile of uh, behaviors and such as sleeping, sitting, standing, and socialization and so on, and, and, and working with clinicians to see how these will help to, um, to provide uh, valuable clinical information. So, okay, so I'm almost done here. Um, the last, uh, but not the least, is that um, this work in smart sensors and uh, computer vision algorithms shouldn't be standalone, they should be integrated in a, in a healthcare ecosystem. So for example, we've had also work working with dermatologists on burn patients, oops, as well as um, uh, with surgeons on surgical videos and so on, and I won't be able to get into this work. So um, I've shown you um, work in sensing human activity recognition and ecosystem. There's still a lot, a lot more to be done, and I won't be able to 
I'll get into the details. I think there needs to be way more collaboration between AI and clinicians and puts humans in the center and use the technology to enhance clinicians' work, to give back time for the clinicians to be with the patients, do the hard work, and reduce their fatigue. So I'm going to skip the future work, because uh, this is our vision of future hospital humans and robots. <laughs> Um, and I just want to end with this. A lot of the, what's driving us is uh, we recognize uh, the need for, um, in the aging population, aging society, we have so much more need uh, for um, better well-being, better living in the age of AI and uh, machine learning. And we hope uh, this work can um, proliferate uh, beyond our own groups. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Amazing technological and personal achievements. For the sake of time, we won't be able to get too many questions. Actually, I want to have a different kind of question. Amongst your many accomplishments, Finch, you are the co-founder of AI for All. <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit, or what your perspective on, who's in, not in this room that should be here? Who can be and should be involved in driving the progression of AI? What happens if we don't pay attention to that? You well, pointed out our organizing committee is a lot of men of privilege. Me and Margaret po pointed that out. Yes. So uh, thank you, Jonathan, for, for bringing that up. So in the age of AI that uh, I noticed a few years ago, I wake up every day with a sense of crisis that uh, AI is, uh, has a diversity problem just like tech itself. And we know probably everyone in this room would believe that AI would change the world. The question is, who will change AI? It, uh, I firmly believe there's no independent machine values. Machine values are human values. So if our developers, and creators, and thought leaders of AI are not bringing in the diverse hum human values into our technology, it'll be biased, it'll be unfair, it'll be not transparent, and it'll cause a lot of social issues. So from that point of view, AI for All was created um, to inc encourage all walks of life, uh, underrepresented minority high school students to participate in the study and research of AI. We started with Stanford itself. We were focusing on girls from high schools. And by 2018, AI for All is expanded to uh, six um, campuses in Berkeley. It's for low-income students. Princeton is for racial minorities. CMU is for rural students. Boston University is for girls. And Simon Fraser University for rural and uh, women. And we'll be continue to expand. And we would love to work with uh, people in this room to um, support AI for All. Very good. Thank you Thank so much, you. Dr. Lee, on so many levels. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.